So how are you going to find the hemochromatosis gene? Well, somebody clever identified a recognizable sequence. This was a, an area of another gene that was involved in iron metabolism. And they saw this on a gene on chromosome 6. We had kind of known where it was, but without knowing the precise location. And that's what led to the discovery of the gene. Once the gene was discovered, it was fairly quickly developed into a simple genetic test. It's one of the simplest genetic tests going because the typical hemochromatosis patient, they almost all have exactly the same genetic mutation. I mentioned the AIR study. So this was a huge project. This is where we sampled, and you can see London there. And we also sampled in Washington, D.C., Birmingham, Alabama, Irvine, California, Portland, Oregon, and Honolulu, Hawaii. So our conclusion was that amongst self-reported Caucasians, one in 227 were homozygous. That's a very high number. 101,168 people tested. 12,993 have an elevated ferritin. It's extraordinary. 5,997 have an elevated TS. And the number of C282Y homozygotes is about 300. So we got 300 people who have genetic hemochromatosis, and we've got 12,993 who have elevated ferritin that don't. So that's the problem with ferritin, is it's a nonspecific test that goes up in all kinds of other things. Through the AIR study, we discovered that there's lots of patients that have these genes that don't have any symptoms, may not even have an elevation in their iron blood test. So that's kind of like a non-expressing case. And that was much more common than we had suspected, particularly in women. Okay, getting back to the AIR study. This is self-reported arthritis. On the left are men. So the red are the hemochromatosis people. And the green are what we call the control group. You see in the control group, there's 10,000 people. And there's no difference in joint stiffness in the men between the normals and the hemochromatosis. And in the women, the same thing. We've got 16,000 people in the normal group. So this is one of the problems in any study that we've looked at in hemochromatosis, is the attribution of symptoms to the disease. So what did we learn from the AIR study? These were published. Some of these were a great disappointment to patients and to some of the doctors that mass population screening is not recommended. I'm going to show you why they concluded that. There's more genes than illness. That's definitely true. Mild elevations in ferritin are very common in the general population. I'm not talking about hemochromatosis now. In the AIR study, where we sample 100,000 people, 20% of all the men tested had an elevated ferritin. 20%! That's extraordinary. And really raises the question of what's the reference range or normal range. You'll notice that labs now, blood labs, they never talk about normal range anymore because they're not sure there are any normal people. <laughs> they talk about reference range. And if you do that for ferritin from the AIR study, for men, the upper range of normal is 660. <coughs> so all these people that are in my clinic whose ferritins are 301 and 520 and so on are very worried, but their ferritin might be in the reference range. And in fact, in Australia, they've changed the reference range to 600. I would say the most misinformation out there is about this test, the transfer and saturation. And whenever we have a scientific question, I'd like to return to the scientific evidence. And that's what we did here in the AIR study. These are people in the AIR study who had their transfer and saturation measured twice. The black dots are C22Y homozygotes, and the open circles are everybody else. 
So if you are proposing transfer and saturation to be a screening test or a diagnostic test for hemochromatosis or a test for anything, it has to be reproducible. It has to be every time you do it, you're in the zone, like the wrong zone. And here you see with these people that their transfer and saturation is all over the map. Because if it was the same both times, you'd have a straight line going up the diagonal. And you don't see that at all. You see this tremendous scatter. So that's why it's not a good screening test for hemochromatosis. It doesn't mean it's a terrible test. It's a helpful test. It's part of the toolkit. OK, let's get back to symptoms. One of, one of the most controversial studies in the field, and one that killed a lot of our grants, was this one by Ernest Boitler at Scripps, San Diego. And he studied people with C282Y homozygote positive. Those are the red bars. But he was one of the first people to bring in a big control population. And now we're back into who's normal, what's a normal, how do they get into the control population. And there's big numbers in this study. Like, th this is 20,000 people. So these are percentages. So, for example, a lot of people say they're very fatigued, and that must be their hemochromatosis. Well, here you see that the prevalence of fatigue in the control group was exactly the same. And if you go across here, if you look at arthropathy, that's stiff joints, it was higher in the control group than it was in the hemochromatosis people. Diabetes, there was more diabetes in the control people than in the hemochromatosis people. So this was kind of a shocker. It went against the grain. Um, and the only one that was significantly higher in hemochromatosis was the liver group. And this reached statistical significance. Now this study was criticized that they went into a, a wellness clinic. So if you start with healthy people, you find healthy people. But that's kind of what we did in the AIR study too. We wanted to find sort of random, normal people. So we wanted to uh, look at this in the AIR study, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. I don't want you to feel that nobody gets sick with hemochromatosis, because this is a picture of a liver with cirrhosis, which just means scarring. And the top part is stained for iron, and all that turquoise blue is iron. So about 15% of the people that are referred, that's different than being in a population study, without alcohol abuse had cirrhosis. Now it's almost unheard of for females to have cirrhosis unless they have something else going on. This is the study that killed population screening. And this came out while we were doing the AIR study. This is the Copenhagen Heart Study. It had nothing to do with hemochromatosis, nothing to do with iron. These are people in Copenhagen that were being studied for heart disease. So it's a population study, it's large numbers of people, and they go every three years and give blood to be tested for cholesterol. They have their blood pressure taken, blood sugar, they're asked if they had a heart attack in the past three years, have you had a stroke? And they've been doing this for many, many years. Now somebody in an ethics miracle got permission to do genetic testing for hemochromatosis 25 years into the study on stored blood. So now they discovered a whole bunch of people in Copenhagen who had genetic hemochromatosis as defined by the, the, the gene test who didn't know they had hemochromatosis, so they didn't have any treatment. So because they had stored blood, they were able to go back and test serum ferritin on that stored blood. You can see it's a 25-year period. So the black dots are the men, and the open dots are women. And if you thought that everybody with hemochromatosis is on that escalator towards cirrhosis, cancer, and death, this study showed that was wrong. And you can see here that there are people that are going down, and there are many people that are flat. So this is a fascinating glimpse into the natural history of untreated disease. Well, here we see that untreated people seem to be doing quite well. And this is also the argument 
for why there could be so many people in the community who have the genes that don't come to medical attention. So as soon as this paper was published, the public health people said, we can't advocate population screening for this disease. 